you would turn now in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. As we continue to make our way through John's epistles, 1 John chapter 2, I'll be reading verses 18 through 27, but as you can see in the bulletin, I'll be focusing on verses 20 through 23. This is uh, actually a, a simple text to understand. Yet we make it more difficult than we need to. I'm probably not going to share anything new that you haven't already heard. But all of this is a good reminder, and we need to remember that the ultimate purpose that John wrote the entirety of this epistle, really all three of his epistles, is to strengthen your assurance, assurance of the grace that God has given to you, that you may know that you have eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. This is the word of our God. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. As I mentioned last week, as we were looking at verses 18 and 19, there is a lot of attraction, if you will. There is a draw for studying things like the Antichrist. When will that happen? Movies are made, book series are written, most of which are garbage, all of them. John is trying to give us assurance, but even as he tries to give us assurance, he warns us of those who would lead us astray. See, part of the reason why John needs to write to give us assurance is because there are those that will try to say, you can't have assurance. You can't really know for sure. And in fact, even in John's day, much of what he wrote was against those who struggle or tried to present, I should say, those who tried to present what is the early stages of what's called Gnosticism. And that only a select elite group of individuals can really be saved, and they're saved by that special innate knowledge. And if you don't have that, you just can't be assured of anything. John's writing to his church there in Ephesus and to you and to me to tell us you can be assured. You'll see those who leave the church. 
But you who have faith can truly be assured. And much of this epistle deals with ways to explain how we can know. The gospel is simple. That's the beauty of it. It's simple. And you understand that part of our assurance actually rests in the simplicity of that gospel. We have this natural tendency to think, well, here's the gospel message. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And we think, yeah, but what else? What else do I need to do? No, the gospel is simple. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't make ourselves right with God. And John's point here is, you don't need some sort of elite knowledge to get in heaven. Some sort of special revelation beyond what Scripture already teaches us. Something that's for a select few. The gospel is simple. Believe in Him and you'll be saved. That's what John reminds us of here in this text today. We see contrasts. Those who deny, those who confess, those who lie, those who speak the truth. And all of it centers around our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Really, what I hope to show out of this text, verses 20 through 23 this morning, is simply this. That anyone who knows and confesses the truth concerning Jesus Christ has salvation in him. Anyone who knows and confesses the truth concerning Jesus Christ has salvation in him. We're going to look at this under two headings. First of all, knowledge of the truth. But then secondly, denial of the truth. Knowledge of the truth and denial of the truth. So first of all, knowledge of the truth. Look again at verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. Now John begins these verses right after what he just talked about with those who left the church. Those who left the church, they were never really of us. They proved that their going, they were never really of us. Now some, of, some think, and there's probably some legitimacy to this, that part of the reason they left was because you people that are here, you just don't have that special knowledge. And the truth is, it's their going that showed they were never really part of the church to begin with. Now John turns around and he says, but you, and John's emphatic here, you, you who stayed, you who trust in Christ, etc. You have an anointing. Now, there is no question that this is yet another text where they just pull out a single word and they think all kinds of crazy things about it. They become Gnostic in their own way. The language that is here, the ESV, it's, it's an okay translation, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. Actually, the language that is used here, it's, it's more to the effect of you have an anointing. You have an anointing. And notice that this anointing comes from the Holy One. And of course, at first glance, you might think, well, the Holy One, maybe that's the Holy Spirit. But the overall context of what John is trying to convey, what John is trying to present, his overall thrust here is Christ himself. It's Christ who is anointed. Now, if we want to be more specific, we can, of course, say that it's really the Father through the Son who anoints. And the Holy Spirit, if anything, the Holy Spirit is that with which they've been anointed. And so we do, at the end of it all, looking at all of Scripture, realize that this anointing really is a Trinitarian thing. It is the Father through the Son with the Holy Spirit. Poured out. 
poured out for us. And because of this anointing, because you've been anointed by the Holy One, by Christ, you all have knowledge. Now, some of you may see a footnote there if you've got the ESV. That's because there's actually a, um, a textual variant. And the textual variant has to do with that word all. Now, it's not a question of whether or not it's there. It's really a grammatical question, whether or not all is the subject of the verb or whether it's the object of the verb. So if it's the subject, like the ESV has it, it's all of you have knowledge. If it's the object of the verb, it's you know all things. Which one is it? Well, in a certain sense, we know from the totality of Scripture that theologically speaking, both are true. But I think given the overall picture that John is trying to convey in contrast to these Gnostics, it's all of you do have knowledge. It seems better to understand it sub subjectively. That is, you have knowledge. And John would need to say that because you have these Gnostics telling you you don't have knowledge. You really don't have it. At best, you're a second-class Christian. John's saying, because you've been anointed by the Holy One, you know. You know. You know what is true. Now, some of you may sit there and think, well, sometimes I feel theologically inept. I don't know my theology. That's not what this is really ultimately about. It's your knowledge of who Christ is. Who is Christ? Why did he come? It's not a question if you can articulate all the nuances of things like the hypostatic union. If you can articulate the various eschatological views. And some of you are probably like, I don't even know what that word means. That's okay. We in the Reformed faith, and sometimes especially in the OPC, we, we kind of present ourselves as somewhat elitist. We do like to study our theology, it's true. We sometimes have an almost ivory tower mentality. But at the end of the day, the heart of the gospel is simple. And simply because somebody may not have the same theological understandings of the intricacies of this or that truth that's found in the Bible doesn't mean they're any less saved than you. This is a hard truth for us sometimes to deal with. Because it's very easy for us to react and say, how do you not see this? Well, how many things in your own life as you read your Bible that you don't see, that others do. We're all weak, but thanks be to God, the gospel is simple. You have knowledge. You have it. Now, it is fascinating because John, had, John uses, we see in the Greek, typically two different words for knowing. One is where we get the word Gnostic from. But John, in this case, uses another word. Now, a lot of times he uses similar words interchangeably, and I think he's doing that here to a degree. But I think the thing about this is the word that we sometimes get the word Gnostic from conveys the idea of learned knowledge, whereas this word, word has to do with innate knowledge. They know it in their heart of hearts because they've been anointed. You don't have to learn it because you've been anointed. You know the truth. You who have been anointed by the Father through the Son, you know. Because you've been anointed with the Spirit who has been poured out into your hearts to impress that same word, that same gospel to your life. 
And notice as John continues here. You all have knowledge in verse 21. I write to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. Verse 21 is conveying or continuing to convey this contrast. It's a response to those Gnostics. And really, not just to the Gnostics of his day. It's really to anybody who professes to be a Christian and tries to tell you you're somehow a second-class Christian because you don't have A, B, and C. You see, in today's day and age, it would fall under what we sometimes hear, especially in this, this uh, neighborhood, shall we say, this little region of the U.S., if you don't have the ability to speak in tongues, are you really saved? Many of us have run into such individuals. You might call them hyper-charismatics. See, at the end of the day, John is trying to encourage them. He writes to them, as he has said time and time again, I am writing to you, and here's another reason why. Not because you don't know the truth. John is not writing something new here. He's not trying to convey a new thought. He's trying to encourage them. I'm not writing to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it. In other words, he's telling them what they already know. And sometimes you and I, we get into these situations in everyday life where somebody tells us something that's so obvious and we're like, well, thanks, Captain Obvious. Thanks for, I already know that. You don't have to waste your breath. I'm looking around, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if some people heard, had this conversation this morning. We probably did. But John is encouraging you. He writes these things to you, believer, because you already know the truth. You know it in your heart of hearts. Sometimes we do write things to someone or say things to someone to clear up something mistaken. Instead, John here writes because they know the truth. This knowledge is not an acquired knowledge, but innate as a result of the anointing that they have received. You see, beloved, if you have faith in Christ, the Spirit of Christ is in you. That's why you know. That's why you know. There are no grades to the level of Christianity that you have. You can't be more justified than another person. That's the beauty about the doctrine of justification. It's equal in all. All of you who have faith in Christ will stand before Christ just as justified, clothed in His perfect righteousness. He's not going to stand before you on the day of judgment and say, well, this person here is more reformed than you. As much as we might like to hear that we're more reformed than other people, that person who, theologically speaking, knows very little, will stand before Christ fully justified. They know it. They know who Christ is. John continues... But because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. You see, at the end of the day, what, what John is speaking of here is this, not just simply propositional statements. Not facts. Two plus two equals four. That's a fact. It's a true statement. But what John is trying to convey here is that those who have been anointed by the Father through the Son with the Holy Spirit, they know the truth, and the truth is Christ himself. They know Christ. 
They know him. So, of course, all of this reminds us that because they know Christ, they know that in Christ there is no lie. There's no falsehood. And if you know the truth, even as we read earlier as a part of our gospel reading, the truth will set you free. Not partially free until you learn a little bit more, but free. True freedom comes through faith in Christ who sets us free. And John writes these things to you because you know the truth. As opposed to what others may try to tell you. Whether they be Gnostics. Whether they be social justice warriors. Whether they be hyper-charismatics. You who know Christ, you're free. And you know this truth. You've been anointed. They may argue, well, you're not speaking in tongues. How could you possibly be anointed? Do you have faith in Christ? Then the Spirit of Christ is in you. You've been anointed. It really is that simple. That's knowledge of the truth. That's really knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, I told you there's nothing new here. But the gospel is simple, and though it is simple, it is still no less glorious. Well, having looked at knowledge of the truth, let's move on to our second point, denial of the truth. Look now at verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. John asks the question here, who is the liar? It's a rather interesting question because it seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Isn't a liar just somebody who speaks that which is contrary to the truth? Not, I'm not talking about maybe misunderstanding the truth, but one who deliberately perpetrates falsehood. You know, it's one thing. As a former math teacher myself, if I were to tell a young child, that 2 plus 2 equals 5, I'd be lying. But if they believed that lie and they were running around saying 2 plus 2 equals 5, 2 plus 2 equals 5, they're mistaken. They're not lying. That's the difference here. Who is the liar? Who's the liar? The reason seems to be, and it's worded here and presented as a question, it seems to be that John is presenting this in such a way as to be a response to the accusation made by the Gnostics. We have the truth. You guys don't. Don't listen to the apostles. They don't know what they're talking about. So John responds, who, who really is the liar here? Who is it that's really the liar? Regardless of the ultimate reason that John chooses that wording of the question, the liar ultimately is the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's the basic understanding. Who's the liar? The one that denies that Jesus is the Christ. And my friends, in today's day and age, apart from pure uh, from a human perspective, just pure atheism, and even those who try to deny there even was a Jesus. There are many who are so-called spiritual people. They like what Jesus has to say, his teaching about love and brotherhood and getting along and caring for one another. They like that, but you know what? They don't confirm that Jesus is the Christ. They think Christ is just his last name. Christ is a title. Jesus is his name. And of course, the name Jesus is just sort of an English version of a Latin, which is, of course, similar to the Greek, which is really just a transliteration of what we think of Joshua, Yeshua. 
It means the Lord saves. That's what his name means. And the fact that he is the Christ means he was anointed himself to accomplish that which his name means. So in other words, to deny that Jesus is the Christ is to deny that Jesus came to save sinners. Jesus came to save sinners, to deny him being the Christ. You see, Gnostics in their own way, they acknowledged Jesus, but they, they did so in this weird way. And it depends which sort of branch you're talking about. But Jesus was this average, ordinary dude who just walked the streets. And then the Logos, that Christ figure, that spiritual knowledge, kind of came down upon Jesus. And then, as he was led to the cross, then that Christ, that spiritual knowledge, left him. That's false. It's not that Christ came to Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. From the moment of his conception, until all of eternity, Jesus is the Christ. And the one who denies that he's the Christ, he's the liar. Notice that John doesn't say in this case, such a person, they're just misunderstanding. They just, they just think a little bit differently than you do. John is point blank here. That person is a liar. Now, from a human perspective, it may seem that such an individual, they're just confused. They don't really have correct understanding. But we know from the Apostle Paul we, that at the end of the day, everybody knows the truth innately. They just suppress the truth and unrighteousness. The Word of God also reveals the truth. It is authoritative. It is actually true, but they will deny what the Word says. They will deny the apostles' teaching and say, nope, Jesus was not the Christ. Such a person is a liar. And so how do they get around it today with God's Word? Well, the Apostle Paul didn't really write that. The Bible is just human authors. Just kind of piece together. Don't tell me what Paul said. Show me what Jesus said. These are the ways that the world operates. You see, what we have in our Bibles from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of Revelation is all Jesus' words. Really, we should all be red-letter editions. I really don't care about red letter editions either way, by the way. If you want a red letter edition, fine with me. I've got them at home myself. But the point is, is that all of the Bible is the words of the Christ. And the world will try to say to you, no, don't believe that portion. Because it says things I don't like. Who is the liar? It's the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. And notice John goes even further. He goes much further than calling one a liar. He says that this is the Antichrist. And the ESV gets it right here. It's not he, it is this one. This one, the one who says that Jesus is not the Christ, is the Antichrist. You think being called a liar is bad. This one is the Antichrist. John is warning us of the spirit of Antichrist for all ages. People get so focused on the Antichrist. When will he come? 
that they forget that the spirit of the Antichrist has been here even in John's day. Those who deny that Jesus is the Christ. And such a spirit of Antichrist denies not only that Jesus is the Christ, but notice what John says here. He who denies the Father and the Son. It's a denial of both Father and Son, their relationship, who they are, what they plan to do, all that they is entailed with respect to the salvation of sinners. They deny the Father and the Son. You see, at the end of the day, to deny the Son really is to deny the Father. We saw that in John's Gospel. To deny the Father and the Son is to deny the Gospel itself. It's to deny the Gospel itself. Now, I get it. Within Christianity, there's all kinds of debatable things that we can disagree on. Eschatology. Pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill. Even baptism. Credo-baptism, paedo-baptism. But to deny the Father and the Son denies the gospel, and there's no hope for such individuals. Again, Jesus said in John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. There is no hope. That sounds terrible. That sounds discriminatory. How can you say that Jesus is the only way? I'm just reiterating what Jesus himself said. Remember that Jesus, you said you love his teaching? There are things debatable within Christianity. That's for sure. Theological discussions and debates done rightly have their place. Iron sharpens iron. I get this. But this is not debatable. You see, the gospel is so simple that as a result, it's not debatable. Just like you can't debate, although there seems to be an attempt today that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's not debatable. But somehow math is becoming racist and misogynistic and things like that. But the gospel is simple, and because it is simple, it is not debatable. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. You who deny who Christ is, what he came to do, you deny the Father. There are not many roads to heaven. The only way to heaven is through the door, Jesus Christ. And if you deny him, you have shut that door to heaven from yourself. But then John gets positive again. No one who denies the Son has the Father, but now, notice, whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Whoever confesses the Son. In contrast to the one who denies the Son, John provides a simple statement intended to give believers assurance. If you confess Christ, you have the Father. It's really that simple. But what about all this extra special knowledge that they're talking about? Do you confess Christ? Do you believe in your heart of hearts that the Lord sent him to die for your sins? Then you have the Father. Do you not see how simple that is and yet how assuring that can be? When we kind of kick back and say, well, there's got to be something more, we're, we're distrusting the simplicity of the gospel. Let it go, guys, really. And forgive me for being so casual, but make it simple. Make it understandable. 
the gospel. You trust in Christ. You have eternal life. That's it. Don't complicate matters of the gospel beyond that. If you simply submit to its simplicity and the realization of what it actually says, it is so freeing, so assuring, such an, a way to instill confidence because at the end of the day, all of the gospel comes from God. We simply respond. Thank goodness that we can't do anything. Nothing we do will matter because we can't do anything. It's all of God. Trust in Christ. Receive His grace. Receive all the benefits. The one who denies the Son, in contrast, the one who confesses the Son, also has the Father. Notice, it's not merely intellectually knowing both, but it's confession. I know it and I confess it. You confess his person. You confess his purpose. You confess his work. You confess Jesus as the Christ. You confess Jesus as the Son of God sent into the world to save sinners like you and me. That's it. If you believe that, you have the Father. If you believe that, you have assured for yourself an entrance into heaven by virtue of who Christ is, by virtue of what he has done. You mean I don't have to have my eschatology right to get into heaven? No, not to get into heaven, but it's certainly helpful to you to understand God better and give him praise and glory. You see, that's the right use of theology and doctrine to learn more about the God who has gifted you eternal life that more and more you may praise and glorify Him. You confess who He is. Such a person has the Father. Confessing Christ, knowing Christ, means to be in living union, not just with the Son, but also with the Father as well. We do rightly focus in our reform circles on the doctrine of union with Christ. All the benefits of the redemption that Christ has purchased for us flow to us by virtue of our union with Christ. But because we're united to Christ, we're united to the Father as well. And of course, by implication, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we're united to the Spirit as well. We are united to the triune God by virtue of the Father anointing us through the Son with the Spirit and all the benefits that Christ has purchased are yours. They're yours. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Maybe some of you here have been struggling day to day, week to week. Am I saved? Maybe some of you aren't even a Christian. And you think, what hope do I have? Your hope is found in simply believing that Jesus is the Christ, the one who was sent by the Father to die for our sins instead of us, to pay the penalty for our sins. But more than that, that you might be clothed in his perfect righteousness and stand before God and enjoy Him for all eternity. Anyone here who today does not know Christ, He's being presented. Hear His voice from His Word. He calls to you, come. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come. Come. 
and I will give you rest. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. This is Christ calling to you. Trust in him and you can be assured you have access to the Father. You can be assured that you will have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the gospel message. It really is that simple. And isn't that a glorious truth? Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Be assured of the salvation that he brings. Don't listen to the naysayers that you have to have all your theological ducks in order. You have to have that second anointing of the Spirit. I don't even know what that is. But there's an ongoing list of things that cults and heretics will try to portray upon to you that you need to do and believe. No, the simplicity of the gospel ought to give you assurance. All you need is Christ and faith in him, the one who is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God sent to deliver sinners from their sins. If you trust in him, be assured you'll be with Christ when he returns and your faith will become sight and you will enjoy the full blessing of the presence of God to all eternity. That's the hope of the gospel. You can be assured of salvation, you who confess and know Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word and what it reminds us of, the simplicity and the truth of the gospel. Father, we do pray that that truth would instill within us humility. That we would recognize that apart from Christ, there'd be no hope. Father, we do pray that this simple gospel truth would give us assurance, but would also motivate us in love to Him, to serve Him, to serve one another, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen.